Welcome, everybody. We're, I'm sitting here with Kari Spencer. This is Greg Peterson, and we are coming to you from the studio at the Urban Farm here today for week one of Designing a Productive System with Livestock. And uh, this is all you, Kari. I'll be around to produce this thing and add two cents worth along the way, but uh, jump in. Let's go. All right. Here we go. <laughs> I'm so excited about this class, and oh gosh, we have packed a lot in here, and, and I want to make sure that we get it all covered and uh, hopefully communicate this really clearly to everybody. All right, well, I am Kari Spencer, and I am the proprietor of the Microfarm Project, which is a uh, an urban farm just north of Greg's Farm in Phoenix, yep. and we have between a quarter and a third of an acre. And on that plot, we have experimented with all kinds of ways to grow food, and we're trying to grow as much food as we possibly can, but not overwork or overwhelm ourselves, but really enjoy it and have lots of fun doing it. What we're going to cover today is just some basics. Before we bring animals home to our farm, uh, we want to find out how to analyze and design our urban farm so that it becomes increasingly abundant over time and that it's easy and inexpensive to manage. Um, we really want high yield and the healthiest food possible. And also our backyard farms can be a benefit to the surrounding environment as well, which is a, a bonus. Um, so today we will learn about analyzing elements and, and you know what do you want to add to your farm? Why do you want to add it to your farm? And how can it fit into the big picture? And we'll talk about putting elements together using permaculture principles. And permaculture is the art and science of working with nature and not swimming upstream against nature. So what is that all about? Well, we will dive into that some today. We'll talk about streamlining systems for efficiency so that uh, when we have an urban farm with lots of elements on it, it doesn't become a a just a a monster, <laughs> something that sucks all of our time and energy, but that it is really efficient so that we can go out and take care of the things that need to happen on the farm and do it in a manner that's easy and joyful. And we will learn about reducing inputs and energy and maximizing productivity at the same time. And at the very end, then we will have an assignment for you. Don't worry, it's not a uh, term paper or anything like that. <laughs> All right, so what does a farm need? Uh, if you think about a farm, if we can just imagine that our backyard farms are uh, a, a completely enclosed system with a big high wall all the way around it with one entry point. Inputs are the things that have to come into the farm to make the farm run. And, um, and outputs are things that the farm produces. So what does the farm need? These are inputs. And, um, you know, I said that these are all things that need to come into the farm, but actually these are things that could be produced right on farm. But the way that we are typically taught to have a garden or the way we're taught to raise animals is to bring all this stuff in through the gate. So um, we need healthy soil. So, um, you know, we can buy compost or we can um, buy composted soil. Uh, and that is an input that, that might be needed for our farm. Or we could make it. <laughs> Nutrients are another input. Uh, you know, that's also known as fertilizer, uh, but it could also be soil amendments. Farms need pest control. We don't want uh, rabbits decimating our farm. We don't want uh, hornworms uh, taking down our tomato plants. So we need some form of pest control on the farm. Pollination is absolutely essential. Without pollination, we cannot have fruits or vegetables. And without um, plants, uh, we can't really raise animals because uh, most of the animals that we raise on a farm eat plants. That's their food. So pollination is essential to all of us. Waste management. Um, in a backyard farm situation, waste management is a crucial element. And we can either... Uh, have waste that becomes a pollutant, or we can have waste that becomes part of our nutrient stream. So we'll get into that today. Another input might be odor, odor control, especially on a small farm. If you have uh, several animals on your farm in a confined space, then odors need to be 
dealt with physical labor. There's physical labor on a farm for sure. Um, profit. A farm needs profit in order to be sustainable. And by profit, I don't just mean um, maybe selling things and earning money, but also a farm needs to be profitable in the sense that uh, we are growing things that that uh, we don't have to buy. So they contribute to our family and to ourselves economically. Really, from a permaculture perspective, um, the notion of profit is just all of the prosperity that you grow. Mm -hmm. So if you shift your shift your thinking from profit is dollars to profit is just the prosperity that's there. Mm -hmm. And I talk to students at, at ASU about this all the time and actually in public. Um, there's only one place on the planet that lack lives. Mm -hmm. It's between our ears. Yeah. Everywhere else, <laughs> if we look in nature, if we look at the abundance of everything that there is in nature, and really when you stop to think about it, look at all the abundance that lives in the human system. We have an abundance of pollution, an abundance, abundance of cars, and an abundance of houses. There is so much prosperity out there. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, the the notion of profit, we have to be really careful that we don't say, "Oh my God, profit's bad," because in a in a sustainable system, uh, profit is a big part of that. If it's not profitable, it's not sustainable. That's right. Yeah, yeah and we're going to explore abundance here. Nice. In the next. Uh, in a few slides. <laughs> and uh, farm needs support. So, uh, you know, it, either that's just the farmer doing all of the work, or it could be other forms of, of support. And, of course, enjoyment. We really want to enjoy our farm. So those are some of the inputs. And those inputs can either be trucked onto the farm through that gate, or they can be things that we produce actually on the farm. So in exchange for all of these inputs, all of these needs, we desire and expect abundance. We want some outputs. <laughs> we can call them generically outputs, but outputs are anything, any form of abundance, anything that uh, you grow for, for eating or for other purposes on your farm. And these are some pictures of the abundance that we produce on our farm. Lots of things that we can, um, eggs, we've got milk and and uh, we make cheese. Now, um, just as an FYI, I do not currently have any goats on my property, so I'm really, really missing the milk. I have a book contract that I am um, needing to fulfill, and it requires me to travel. And if you have milk goats, it's really hard to uh, maintain milking when you're not at home. <laughs> so just for those of you who are wondering or who have heard through the grapevine that I don't have goats right now, that is true. I do not have them right now. Uh, but I can still share with you all the things that we learned, and, and I still keep in contact with my goats, and I go help the people who have them. Um, some of them are with our neighbors and help with them with their projects, and I'm hoping to get some back at some point because I really enjoy the outputs of a goat, the milk is fantastic and uh, goats have other functions as well on a farm and so good farm design really minimizes the amounts of inputs that have to be trekked in through the gate and it maximizes the output the abundance and that prosperity that greg was referring to and so we want to have as little input that we bring in, that we have to pay for, or that we have to um, go find somewhere off of our farm, and maximize the number of outputs that we get from from um, all of the things that we do to grow and raise food on the farm. But in the beginning, if we just jump in and begin farming without a plan, boy, it, what can really happen is that the inputs can exceed the outputs. And how do I know this? Because I did it. And, you know, when I started farming, um, I, I started with gardens, and then I thought I would add some chickens and other animals, and I got so excited about it that I would um, essentially, you know, bring home a couple of goats and say to my husband, okay, now we got the goats, what are we going to do with them? Where are we going to house them? And it was really backwards. And, um, and we ended up having to bring in truckloads of hay for those goats and and other things that cost us a lot of money because I really hadn't thought in the beginning, how am I going to take care of these goats in a manner that um, does not require me to go out and buy a lot of stuff 
for them. I hadn't thought in advance about how they could fit into the whole system and actually be an asset to the system, not just producing milk, but also um, contributing to the system as a whole. And also I hadn't thought about how the system could actually support them, how things that we were growing and raising on the farm could support the goats. Um, I, they were just kind of a separate element that I brought onto the farm. And, and that kind of thinking led me to have to buy a lot of things to feed and take care of those goats. So I, but I learned because I discovered very, very quickly that that was not ideal. And I began doing a lot of research and we began doing a lot of experimenting on our farm. So this class is all about what we learned so that we can share that with you as you are either just starting your farm or as you are um, doing rolling permaculture, as we call it, where you <laughs> take a farm that was not initially very sustainable or regenerative and make it, um, turn it into a permaculture farm. And you can design the urban farm of your dreams, and it's all about understanding and tapping into relationships. That is a really key part of planning a farm. And so what do I mean by relationships? Well, in the free webinar, we talked about how does a forest thrive with relatively few inputs? You know, nature does so many things without um, any energy source, uh, you know, not needing anybody to, uh, not needing a manager to maintain it. It just maintains itself. Uh, the ball started rolling and now it just keeps rolling. <laughs> and it's really quite amazing. <laughs> Take a trip to a forest and, um, you know, here in Phoenix, that's a challenge to go find a forest unless we go up north. Uh, but an ecosystem such as a forest functions like a living organism like a body in which every part performs functions that support the body as a whole. So your human body could be considered a kind of an ecosystem where you've got all the parts functioning together and supporting each other. And most of what your body needs is actually taken care of in-house. Okay, so we eat food to get nutrients and we drink water and there are a few outside inputs. But for the most part, our body manages itself, and an ecosystem is, is similar to that. An ecosystem um, is very productive, has lots of output, and regenerates itself over and over and over again, and, um, and provides its own needs in-house. So all of the nutrition that's needed for the animals are produced in-house, the nutrients for the plants, um, they retain their own water, they filter their own water, they provide their own pest control, they provide so many things just on its own um, that, you know, in 30 seconds or a minute, you can't possibly even explain it. It's just unfathomable to me how amazing this kind of system is. And I want that on my farm. A yeah. little bit of that on my farm. <laughs> you know, I was walking around in the backyard at the urban farm the other day, and it is just so lush and dense back there. Mm -hmm. And in big part, it's because I've been doing this for 25 years. Yeah. You know, there's just this denseness of, of everything back there. That's right. It begins to become its own ecosystem. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and, you know... That is really the goal. But how, how do you do that on your farm? Well, we want to mimic nature and how nature does things. And so we want to create relationships like nature does. So start by considering how can the living elements on your farm relate to each other? Now you're not just talking animals here. No. Yeah. No, all of the living elements on your farm. Um, you are a living element on your farm. Um, the animals, the plants, the microorganisms, the bees, the insect, other insects. How do these elements that are on our farm relate to each other? How, do they, how can they help each other? How can they meet each other's needs? And also, how can the non-living ele elements on your farm relate to the other elements? So on a farm, you've got lots of structural things and tools and all kinds of stuff, but where you place them on your farm really matters. In, in terms of flow and how things work together. Um, like, for instance, if you uh, have your chicken coop, you can place your chicken coop in an area on your farm where 
Um, it can absorb heat from the sun in the winter mm-hmm. to keep your chickens warm or where it can, if you're in a climate like ours, we put ours where it can get lots of shade. shade. <laughs> yep. um, you know, putting your chicken coop near where your composting area is can be very helpful. Just placing those elements, even the non-living ones, uh, on your farm in, in correct relationship to each other so that um, they function together well and make things easier. So we're going to be talking about how that works. Uh, How can new elements improve your farm system? So maybe you have some gaps in your system. Once you get your farm going, you realize, oh, boy, there's something missing here. Um, How do you analyze a new element and how do you fit new elements onto your farm? And how do you want to relate to your farm? How big do you want it to be? How many things do you want on it? How much work do you want it to be? Or how little work do you want it to be? Do you like spending time out there? Do you want to spend your weekends out there? Do you not want to spend your whole weekend? Do you want to be able to travel? Um, What are all the things that come into play as far as who you are and what you want to get out of your farm and what you want to put into it? All of these things are things that we need to think about when we're designing a farm. And there really aren't any right or wrong answers to these questions. They're just how how does it work best for you and how does it work best um, for nature on your particular property? And that could be different for you and me. Let me give you just a brief example of this. This is just a small system of how things can relate to together on a farm. So, well, and, the, and the thing about this is, is that this is a small, kind of not so many layer system. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I encourage people to do is really start looking at the systems and the depth and breadth of the systems that are happening and then start building on those mm-hmm. in your space. Yep, and we're going to show you how to do that in this webinar. So this we'll start with this simple one, and then later on we'll show you how to expand upon it. But, you know, I noticed that chickens were really good at uh, scratching and digging and and uh, always hunting for little morsels of food, food. And so I thought, well, gosh, you know, I've got a compost pile that I'm always turning, and it has stuff in it that chickens could potentially eat. So why don't I start putting my compost pile in my chicken coop and see what happens? And what I discovered was that if I put all of my compostable materials into the chicken coop, the chickens did all of the work for me. And... I love that. <laughs> my eggs started turning a brighter yellow color because their diet was expanded, and the chickens were very, very happy. They loved to scratch in all of the stuff that I brought to them from my kitchen and from my yard waste. And, um, you know, they started finding bugs and worms and things that like to inhabit compost pile as well. And um, we actually started making more compost than we could make before and make it faster. And when we added goats to our system, they could break down that goat waste much, much faster than a um, bin compost system could. And they got the added benefit of eating all the scraps that the goats didn't eat as well. And it just became this circular system that began to function really, really well. So all of the yard waste and kitchen scraps would go to the chickens. The chickens would compost it. Then I would... uh, send it back to the gardens, the garden soil improved, the output from my gardens improved. We ended up getting more and more lovely produce, which meant there were more scraps to go to the chickens. And uh, so then they could make more compost. And we ended up making so much compost that we were giving it away to community gardens. Um, So this is how the relationships work. I could have a separate compost pile, a separate chicken coop, and a separate garden, but instead we incorporated them all together relationally so that they could support each other and so that they could do the work of gardening. And the chickens enjoy that work a whole lot more than I enjoyed okay. turning compost. Uh, so it, it, this kind of a thing really got me turned on to, to making more permaculture oh, yeah. in my backyard. And so... Um, Now I'm always thinking that way. I'm always thinking in terms of functional analysis. You know, anything that I have on my farm or I want to add to my farm, I'm always thinking of what functions can they do and (laughs) how can they be incorporated into a system like this. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's and really so important. that's the fun of functional analysis. <laughs> we put the fun in functional oh. analysis. Of <laughs> course. Did that come out of the permaculture design course? I don't know if it did. Uh, well, I don't know. You should include it next time. I think so. Maybe maybe we should. Uh, and uh, I'm going to teach you how to do this on paper. And I started off doing it on paper, but now I just do it in my head. Mm -hmm. You know, so if as we're going through this class, don't think it's always got to be this chore that you got to write it all down. You know, after you've written it down a few times, you'll just be able to do this naturally and begin to do functional analysis uh, just kind of readily. To do functional analysis and do it in a fun way, first think about what you already have. What do you already have on your property? And make a list of those things. Then, once you've listed it out and really brainstormed, okay, gosh, what do I already have? Think about what are the needs of each of those elements. So if you've got chickens, what do your chickens need? If you have gardens, what do your gardens need? Um, you know, if you have trees, what do your trees need? Then consider the value of each element and its characteristics it's, and its, or its behaviors if it's an animal. Um, how can it benefit your farm and how can it be employed on your farm? You know, everything needs to have a job. Everything needs to be employed. We have some um, dogs on our farm and, of course, we enjoy them, just the company of those dogs. But they're also employees on our farm because they were livestock guardian dogs and they are still livestock guardian dogs. They take care of our animals and they make sure that predators don't get to them because we have coyotes in our area. So. Everything um, should ha be employed. We have rabbits on our farm as well. They're very underutilized. Uh, we don't use them for meat rabbits, but they do make fertilizer. Uh, so they have a job. They make fertilizer. So everything should, should uh, give back to the farm in some way. So list the obvious things that, uh, that the elements on your farm can do, but also try to think out of the box like I did with my grapefruit tree. And don't leave out the negatives because there is always a positive side to every negative. And as Bill Mollison, who is the uh, inventor and founder of permaculture, he says the problem is the solution. So um, think about how problems can be solutions. As an example, in this photo, and it's a little bit small, I wish, I wish uh, it was a little bit bigger, but here is my husband and a good friend of ours, and they're moving our goat and sheep pens around our uh, lawn. Now, I always thought that if we got goats and sheep that they would manicure the lawn and keep it uh, lush and green and perfectly mown. But what happened instead is they destroyed the lawn. So we would move them around so that they would uh, trample and eat it in one area and leave the other areas alone. And, you know, I thought, gosh, they're just destroying my lawn. This is a real negative. But then I thought about it because we're always in Phoenix trying to get rid of Bermuda grass in our gardens. We do not want it because it's an invasive grass. And that's what my lawn was, Bermuda grass. But there were areas where they had completely decimated the Bermuda grass. So instead of lamenting that, I ended up tilling up those areas and growing a Three Sisters garden in those areas. So you can see in the foreground of this picture some corn stalks. So I grew corn. And uh, right behind the corn, I planted beans and squash. And we grew those in those areas of the lawn. They were irrigated with my sprinkler system, so they're already getting water. And there was no grass there to compete. And so we grew those gardens. And what ended up happening was that at, towards the middle of the growing season, the grass started to reappear and come back because of the water that was there. And so I just let it grow. And then once we had harvested all that corn, and all those squash and uh, all the uh, beans, we removed the garden and let the grass grow back. And then we could move the sheep and goats back onto that area and they would have fresh grass. And, the, and I would move the garden over to uh, the area where they'd been previously and uh, to restore that area. So we just moved them around like that, growing gardens and uh, in the spots that they where they had destroyed the grass. And then the corn stalks would go into the goat pens and at the end of the season and they would eat all the, uh, the material off the corn stalks and they just loved it. So it became a really nice um, system.
And that occurred out of uh, just thinking through a problem and how we could turn it into an asset. All right, so once you have done your functional analysis, you've thought about the needs of uh, the elements that you have or want on your property, and after you've thought about how they can give back the things that they do and the things that they produce, uh, then you can begin to start connecting the dots between the elements to create some of these systems like uh, the chicken composting system that I showed you a few slides back. Okay, so some things to think about are uh, some of the permaculture principles and um, some different things that we have just learned that I'm throwing in here for you. The first is relative location. So, you know, the core of permaculture design is the connection between things and thinking through those connections. So how could the needs of one element be filled by the outputs of another element? Um, so instead of trucking in hay, you know, could I use um, something on my farm to meet the, the nutritional needs of my goats? Um, so, you know, I know my goats need to eat. So what, what could I do? I could start growing some things in my garden for them. I could start growing moringa trees that could provide some shade for them, but also food. Um, there could be lots of elements that could meet those needs so that I would not have to go off property and buy so much hay. Um, and in our goat class, we'll talk, we'll get into more of that specifically related to goats. Um, how can you place the elements relative to each other to facilitate a connection? In this picture, it's again, it's a little bit small and hard to see, but this is a fenced off garden area and in the, in the foreground and way in the back on the right hand side, you can see some structures and, and there's, uh, there's actually three of them in this garden and these are rabbit hutches. And these rabbit hutches Half of the floor was just wire, and half of it was solid. So the, on the side that was wire, all of the droppings from the rabbits could just fall directly into this garden area. So uh, one uh, season, I was not growing much over in this garden, and I wanted to kind of renovate the soil. So I put my uh, rabbit pens in that garden so that the droppings could fall directly onto the garden. I wouldn't have to scoop them up and clean them up and then move them over there. So it, it reduced the amount of labor that I had to do. The uh, chickens were allowed in there and they would scratch through and break down those rabbit droppings and uh, scratch them into the soil and they helped to renovate the soil as well. And they would go underneath those chicken hutches and just have a heyday scratching through all of the um, alfalfa that the chickens, that the rabbits hadn't eaten that would fall through the floor and also the droppings from the rabbits. And so um, the rabbits got the benefit of just spending the spring in this beautiful garden and, um, and we would feed them some things that were still growing in there and um, it really worked beautifully. I, it fertilized the grapevines that were in there wonderfully and um, so just having them in that location saved me a lot of work. It saved steps on the farm and um, became a nice system that benefited the rabbits, the garden, the chickens, and uh, the whole system. The next thing I want you to think about is uh, having each element perform many functions. Okay, so I thought of goats for with one function. Goats were going to come on my farm and make milk. One function. But what I discovered is that goats have many, many more potential functions. Like eating grass? They eat grass. They can eat weeds. They can eat brush. <laughs> they can um, have babies, which became an income source on our farm. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, they, you know, they made waste. <laughs> Lots of waste that we turned into lovely compost. So it became not a waste, it became an asset on the farm. Um, so each element should perform many functions. Let me show you these pictures here. Uh, on the lower left-hand side is my husband with our two dogs, and I already told you that the dogs have a job on the farm. They're not just there for fun and to be our companions. They're also uh, livestock guardian dogs. So I don't have problem with coyotes jumping in my backyard because they 
serve the function of being the protectors on the farm. So they do more than one thing on the farm. So uh, that's a very simple way. But also up here on the upper right-hand side, you see some trellises here on the side of the house. The trellises provide uh, room to grow grapes in 3D. So the grapes have a place to grow up, so they're not using so much ground space, right? But what else are these trellises doing? They're on the west side of the house. Yeah. So they're shading that mm -hmm. side of the house nice. and keeping the house cool so that the house has lower utility bills and is more comfortable for the human beings inside. Okay, so there's these trellises are doing more than one thing. They're also creating beauty. So this is going to look really pretty on the side of a house that would otherwise just be bare and boring, right? So three things these trellises do. They're allowing the grapes to grow in 3D, which is space-saving and producing food. It's shading the house, and it's providing beauty, okay? Then down below here, we've got the, my chickens. My chickens do so many things. They compost. They can help to renovate gardens. You know, if I have a garden bed that that um, I want to let rest for a while, I'll send the chickens in there and let them scratch through it. They fertilize it. They get uh, rid of any pests that might be overwintering under the mulch and trying to hide. Uh, they, you know, they just do so many jobs. And in the chicken lesson next week, we'll talk about all of the many potential functions of chicken. So we want each element on our farm to perform more than one function. It's called stacking function, actually. One of my favorite things in permaculture mm -hmm. is how many times can you make that asset do something for you? Yeah. Yeah. The third thing to think about is that each important function should be supported by many elements. Okay? So they do many jobs, but they also should be supported by many elements. Okay. So as an example, if, if you're growing food on your farm um, for you, then your food needs should be supported by many elements on your farm. Maybe you want to grow some fruit trees as well as garden. Yay, fruit trees. Maybe you want to raise some turkeys so that you have meat as well as vegetables. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to have some uh, things that you can so that if your harvest in the next season isn't too good, you still have things from the last season that you preserved and support your food needs. Uh, with many elements on your farm. Um, I also put a picture here of our chickens and the watering systems that we have to support them. So for our chickens uh, in Phoenix, in the summertime, if you don't have multiple water sources, your chickens are a at risk because they can Definitely. die very rapidly yeah. if if their water source uh, goes bad. You know, if they dump it, if they dump their only water source or spoil it, then uh, they're not going to have anything to drink. So in Phoenix, I'm always thinking about multiple water systems for the chickens. So I have some dishes that I put out with water in them. I also have an automatic waterer, which is this triangular shape thing in the picture that um, automatically fills. I also have some water air conditioner, air conditioner water condensate that we collect. And that way, you know, if something happens, if the water gets shut off for a few hours, I've got water right there all summer long from the air conditioning that comes in ag nauseum. Right, like is, 15 gallons a, a day. Yeah. <laughs> when you have, water. you have a, uh, I'm wondering if you have a picture of that there. Do. Oh, you, didn't, you didn't take a picture of your tote? Didn't you put a tote on the condensate? Yeah, we did. We, we changed it out from these 40-gallon barrels to an actual big. 220-gallon tote. tote yeah. How long does that take to fill up? It never gets full because I always use oh, it. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm always using it. We should say what condensate water is just for those people. Yeah, well, know. when you run your air conditioner, uh, some condensate water forms um, just from that process. And there's there's usually a pipe that comes out from the air conditioner, and it will uh, send that water away from your house. So usually it's just dripping off the roof somewhere on the side of your house. We collect that mm -hmm. and we use it. And I actually created a passive system for that now where um, I can hook a hose up and uh, just by gravity I can run that water out to either my chickens uh -huh. or to my um, my grapevine. Oh, nice. Yeah, just passively so I yeah. don't have to tote the water. <laughs> tote it from the tote. 
Okay, so think about how you, know, you can support every system with more than one element. Um, you know, we, we use uh, our chickens to compost, but I'm thinking about adding a vermicomposting system so that I have more than one oh, yeah. composting system to support my garden. All right, the next thing to think about is efficient energy planning. All right, so we have a, a webinar that Greg and I give about called Right Time, Right Plant, Right Place. And it's, we talk in that class about zones and sectors yep. and all these things. But zones are uh, just how we place elements according to their intensity of management on the farm. Mm -hmm. So just in a... So that's in, a really good way of putting it, according to their intensity of management. Because if you need to more intensely, like visit something every day... Mm -hmm. Um, it needs to be closer to where you're at. Absolutely. And that, that's the concept of zones. That's zone. it in a nutshell. <laughs> and if you uh, don't need to ver work on something very intensely, so you know you can maybe visit it once a week or once a month, that's in zone three or four or five. Right. It's farther away. Yeah, so to, to learn more about that, you can uh, Google permaculture zones, or you can uh, look for our Right Plant, Right Place webinar and get in on that the next time. Uh, sectors. Sectors. This is how you use wild energy to your advantage or mitigate the effects of it. So what's wild energy? Wind. <laughs> can you can you make water sounds? <laughs> glub, glub, glub. <laughs> okay, so wind, sun? water, I can't make a sun sound. solar energy, <laughs> gravitational energy was that sizzling that was sizzling was sizzling. That yeah. was sizzling yeah so wild energy sources how can you use them to your advantage on your farm so you know we place our gardens in in places where they can get a lot of sun and uh -huh. use that wild energy of the sun we can use the sun for heating if we you know place a chicken coop so that it, it faces south to keep our chicken coops yep. warmer in the winter yep. time. I, um, I, a great story here. You know me. All, all of you that don't know me yet, I'm always full of stories. Uh, I went over to Chris Carlisle's house here about 10 years ago. And it, he, Chris was very, um, he was very saving when it came to electricity. He was very frugal. That's okay. the word I was looking mm -hmm. for. And I walked into his house. It was January. And, you know, in January, it gets really cold here. It gets down to, like, 38 degrees or something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just frigid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, it might get down to 32, 33, 34. So I walked into his house, and his house was nice and toasty warm. And it's like, okay, this is totally not Chris. What's going on here? You don't have the heat on. So I asked him, and he wandered me into the front room, had a big picture window ah. that faced south, mm -hmm. and he had no carpeting on the floor. Okay. He said, Greg, I let the sun shine on the concrete floor all day, and it absorbs that heat. And then I closed the, you know, he had insulating windows or insulating curtains on the windows, and he just mm -hmm. closed those up at night, and he says, I don't ever have to turn the heat on. Right. Like, oh, bonus. So man. he used free, wild energy. Free, wild energy. There you yep. go. That's awesome. You know, wind, wind can be a problematic on a farm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but actually, wind could be useful. If you could place a, a wind break, if you could place a heat, um, your corn mm -hmm. in an area where it can break the wind for mm -hmm. your other uh, elements on your farm. Corn needs wind oh, to yeah. pollinate. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so you, you can use that wild energy to do something and turn it from a, a detriment into an asset mm -hmm. on, on your property. And slope. You know, sometimes we don't think about putting gardens or animals on slopes, but they're actually a really great place to garden, especially if you live in a wet climate. You can put things at the top of the slope so they don't get waterlogged. Oh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you can grow things on that slope to prevent the wind and water from uh, eroding it, mm -hmm. right? So just using things that could be potential drawbacks and actually turning them into an asset. And always think about using wild energy. Um, gravity is a great source of wild energy. So if you have to haul something, put it at the uh, you know, put it at the top of the slope and haul it down, not the other way around. <laughs> right. You know? So just just thinking in terms of making things easier mm -hmm. and and using natural energy. Well, okay, let's let's take this a little bit further. So you have that slope. Mm -hmm. I was talking to somebody about a, a significantly sloped backyard here in Phoenix, okay. and we don't get all that much rain here. Um, but I was suggesting that they. 
I'm going to call it terrace, mm -hmm. but put in swales. Basically, you put um, level ditches across the backyard, so they run uh, against the slope. They run the other. If the slope is, you know, running downhill, you want mm -hmm. to kind of stop that run that running downhill by putting these ditches right. in place that catches the water. Slow it down and make it go back and forth and back and forth rather than straight down. Exactly. And as it's going back and forth, it's percolating in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so many things to learn about this. <laughs> uh, this is just, you know, we're scratching the surface here today, but I'm hoping to wet your whistle so that you'll want to learn lots and lots <laughs> more. <laughs> Okay, fifth thing to think about, using biological resources to do the work and to provide the energy on the farm. Mm -hmm. uh, so things like, uh, you know, an animal tractor, like in the picture on the right-hand side, upper right-hand side, this is a chicken tractor. I can put my chickens in this tractor, and it's small enough that I can move it around, mm -hmm. and they can mow the grass. <laughs> if I, I'm, they're a biological lawnmower. Nice. Right? Yeah, they do a great job in my backyard. Yeah, and they love it, and they get food source out of it, and they find bugs, and they just take care of that grass. They fertilize it, and it's a win-win situation for the grass and for the chickens and for me because I don't have to mm -hmm. uh, you know, fire up the lawnmower, which I don't even have one anymore. <laughs> I got rid of it. Nice. Um, fertilizers. I can go out and buy fertilizer. But I, on my farm, we have plenty of biological forms of fertilizer, you know, mm -hmm. animal waste. Uh -huh. um, well, gosh, some people get into human urine. <laughs> Hum they call that humanure. If you're interested, there humanure is a book or, called Humanure. Or, uh, you know, YP on that lemon tree. There's that, oh, yeah, yeah, that there resource by the Watershed Management Group. You yep. can <laughs> Google YP on that lemon tree. Uh -huh. Find out about using urine as a source. Now, some people may be going, ah, I'm going to turn off. I'm not going to listen right now. And that's okay. But animal waste is actually a really great form of fertilizer. But also, if you are vegan and you ha just have uh, gardens, then garden waste can be a great form of fertilizer when you compost it down. It becomes a soil amendment that provides nutrients back to the soil. So we can use biological resources as a fertilizer. Also growing things like clover and uh, alfalfa and, uh, and beans and things that can uh, actually fix nitrogen back into the soil, that's a biological uh -huh. resource for fertilizer. And we don't have to go out and buy those things. We can just grow them. Uh, we can use biological resources for pest and disease control. So instead of having the uh, exterminator come to my place, boy, we let the chickens find the scorpions. Oh, yeah. They do a great job of that. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, in, you know, if I have some aphids happening in my garden, instead of going out and buying an aphid spray, I'll just uh, leave alone for a while and see if I can get some ladybugs to show up. To show up. Yeah. And we try to use biological resources rather than uh, going out and buying sprays and things mm -hmm. for for, uh, for control of these things. We also use spoiled milk to control mildew oh, yeah, and yeah. fungus in our garden, mm -hmm. and that's a biological resource. One of the, one of the things that I've started doing here at the Urban Farm is, um, in fact, if you peek out the window out there and look in the back corner of the yard, you can see my pasture that I have. Yeah. Um, and so I've started replacing the lawn in the backyard and then adding things like clover to the front lawn mm -hmm. um, to start so that when I'm mowing, because I still mow the front lawn, when mm -hmm. I'm mowing the front lawn, um, those clippings aren't just grass clippings. There'll be clover clippings and there'll be, you know, other good food sources for the for the chickens. For the chickens. And yeah. even for the lawn, if you just leave some yep, exactly. behind. Right, um, shade and windbreaks. You know, natural shade mm -hmm. is so much better than putting up some sort of shade structure. A tree is the best shade. I'm growing a tree in my chicken coop right now, so I don't have to keep putting the shade up in the summertime because it's just a pain. Right, it gets, exactly. It gets damaged. It gets. It has to be replaced. It's just a thing to manage. But a tree, I don't have to manage. Just let it grow, and it will do more than just shade. It will also increase the humidity and make it more pleasant in mm -hmm. the chicken coop, and it will uh, drop some things on the ground that the chickens might want to eat and compost, right? So uh, biological shade and windbreaks, we already talked about 
Growing corn is a windbreak because corn needs wind. Uh, so just thinking in terms of biological resources. Uh, then also I want you to think about energy cycling. Okay, Retain energy flows on site and turn them into cycles. Okay, As an example, gray water applications and water harvesting. Mm -hmm. okay, so uh, we're going to use water in our house. We can use a lot of that water twice by sending it out to our gardens and landscapes. And then it becomes not a waste and something that just goes down the drain. It actually contributes to the abundance of the system by growing things that produce food, right? So in our case, we have a laundry to landscape system. So when we wash our clothes, the water, uh, instead of draining down into the sewer, goes out to our uh, trees. And we have some fruit trees out there. So um, I'm spending the money on that water, but I'm getting the most out of it that I can because uh, it's washing our clothes, but then it's also producing food. So um, that's a way of energy cycling or just harvesting water in all the ways that we can do uh, water harvesting. Um, then another thing to think about is cascading nutrients. And if you think about a cascade, it's like a waterfall. It just flows by gravity and doesn't require any energy source to make it happen. And uh, cascading nutrients are sort of like an upside-down waterfall. Things flow up, right? So we've All right. got, we've got exactly. uh, never about minerals in the soil that feed the uh, bacteria in the soil. Mm -hmm. The bacteria waste, in turn, feeds the plants. Plants serve as a food source for bigger animals like goats and sheep and chickens. <laughs> and those animals can serve as a food source for larger animals or for predator animals, uh, humans included. And then when, uh, when anything in a system dies, it returns to the soil and starts the whole process over again of feeding those bacteria. And uh, then the bacteria feed the plants and it just becomes a rotation, right? So we can use waste as a nutrient source just like nature does. As an example, I saw a really cool coffee farm that was uh, using their waste to grow mushrooms. Oh, so the nice. was growing these mushrooms. New and York then, City? Uh, it was on a website. I'm not sure exactly oh, okay, where no. it was. You didn't go see it. it was no, there. I didn't no. get to go see that one. Um, aquaponics can use cascading nutrients. So I know there's a couple here in town that uh, has their chickens raised over their aquaponic system, so all the waste from the chickens falls in and feeds the fish, and then the fish, um, you know, create uh, uh, meat or you know fish meat, whatever you call that, and um, and so the nutrients are cycling around and getting used, and then some of, when the humans eat the fish, the fish skin and some of the other parts of the fish go back to the chickens. Mm -hmm. the chickens, it's just like a nutrient cycle. I uh, planted a chicken here recently. She you planted a chicken. She passed away. Mm -hmm. And I dug a hole, with, you know, and so I plant groups of trees, fruit trees together, yeah. and I mm -hmm. just dug a hole and planted her so that it was basically right in the middle of these three fruit trees. Right. And it may sound at first that that's kind of gross, but that's nature. That's, that's nature. natural. That's right. right? Well, but I wouldn't plant a chicken in my veggie garden, but I would plant one under a tree. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. And composting is a form of nu nutrient cycling and, and, and cascading. So we always want to think about how can we turn waste on the farm into an asset? You know, I try not to throw anything away before I think about what I can use it for. Yeah, really big important. Yeah, and that saves a lot of money, and it's also really great for the environment. So it's a win-win. And um, so... We we noticed when we got goats that we had so much waste. It was just becoming a pollutant, right? It was attracting flies. It was, uh -huh. had odors. Uh, so we started giving it to the chickens, and then the chickens composted it down and turned it into a, a really nice resource. Uh, so we didn't uh, we tried not to bag it up and throw it away. You know, we we didn't want to do that because then it was just a pollutant. Uh, so we thought of ways, how can we compost this down real fast so that we can use it as a resource? All right, so then the next 
thing I want you to think about is small scale intensive systems. You know, we don't have to start big. We don't have to do things on the large scale. We can do things on a small scale and really have a productive system. We can grow a lot of food in a very small space if we start thinking um, in terms of systems. We can maximize productivity with the fewest resources. So one way we can do that is by plant stacking. Okay, so in the upper right hand picture, I've got my three sisters garden. This is corn, which is tall, grown with beans that use the corn as their trellis, and uh, squash that grows low on the ground. That's a three sisters uh, plant system, and it's like growing in 3D, you know, um, just uh, thinking in, in terms of stacking those plants and growing things together. Or even time stacking. In our Growing Food the Basics class, we talk about uh, interplanting and we also talk about succession planting. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a space, you can continually have a harvest over a longer period of time if you do succession planting. So you might plant some lettuces this week, some more lettuces next week, or you might plant uh, slower growing plants with faster growing plants so that when you harvest something, you always have something else growing up right behind it. And so that's time stacking. But you can also do livestock stacking. So this class is about livestock, but how do you stack livestock? You know? <laughs> it's not like the picture on the first screen where I have oh, yeah. one goat on yeah, top one, of the other. Yeah, exactly. But uh, this is an example from Polyface Farms. And if you're not familiar with Polyface, you've got to look them up because they're so cool. Um, but in this system, this is a rabbit production system. And they have their rabbits in a, in a hoop house. That keeps them warm in the winter, and they can also shade it to keep their rabbits cooler in the summertime. And these rabbits, you'll notice, are all around the edges of the system, and they are uh, their their cages are up high, off the ground. Okay. The, I've never right? seen anything like this You've before. This it? is cool. This is cool. So the waste from the rabbits. Kind of like how I did this in on a previous slide in my garden, the waste from the rabbits falls down on the ground mm -hmm. to where the chickens are. Also, rabbits are always going to nibble some alfalfa and lose some. Lose some. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. The chickens have a heyday scratching through an the, alfalfa heyday. Yeah, I couldn't resist <laughs> scratching through that waste and they compost it down, right? So the chickens are managing the waste and turning it to compost, and the chickens are enjoying themselves and getting a little extra nutrition from that alfalfa that falls. And then uh, they create this compost, and they manage that waste and turn it into gardener's gold. And I really love the way that they have stacked these livestock in 3D. I know people do this over their aquaponic systems as well. They'll raise something over an aquaponic system. I'm thinking of actually putting a worm bin right under my uh, rabbit hutch. Oh, my gosh, of course. So in fact, there was a, uh, for years, Linda, the local worm lady here in Phoenix, mm -hmm. harvested all of the worm castings from a rabbit farm here in town, and that's what fed her worms. Oh, so she, she got all of the manure from the rabbit uh -huh. farm and fed her yep. Well, why don't I just put my worm farm right under where the rabbits are producing the manure? Exactly. Then I don't have to sweep it up like right. I'm doing right now. Right. Because I sweep it up now and I go throw it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. right, I'll just catch it in my worm farm. Do you have a worm bin? Do you have worms yet? I don't yet. Yeah. It's the next thing on my list. I can show you. It's really easy. Yeah, I saw your worm bin sitting out here on and the patio. And there's loads of worms in there, so if you need some worms to... Okay, <laughs> I'll come and harvest some worms from you to yeah, put in my exactly. bin. It's a plan. Okay, so, and here are some tips for building your system. Start small and simple. You know, start with one or two or three elements, not two dozen like I did. Mm -hmm. Start small. So this is just a picture of some, uh, a few chickens that uh, were young chickens that we were raising and we kept them in this cage until they got big enough to go into the coop. Um, for a person starting out, I would recommend three chickens, not a dozen. Three chickens. See how you like it and see how it works. Make the management nice and easy. That way if one chicken dies, 
uh, you still have two chickens left to keep each other company so they don't get lonely, but it's not an overwhelming number of eggs and mm -hmm. it's not an overwhelming amount of management and you can learn as you go. So start simple with whatever you do. That's true with gardening too. Just grow one or two things you really like and then expand upon the system later. Start smart. Uh, consult with people who are doing what you want to do and learn from them. They can give you lots of tips and you can avoid mistakes. Uh, that's part, part of what this class is about. You all are starting smart by taking a class like this. Um, and who's that in the picture? Do you know who that is? I do. That's Wendell. Wendell from... Wendell Crow yep. from Crow's Dairy. Yep. Yeah, when we were raising our goats, we liked to talk to goat people and see what they were doing. And uh -huh. Wendell gave us this really awesome tip about how to feed our goats. You can see that he puts all of his hay outside the goat pens and they have to stick their heads through to eat it. That way they, they don't spoil their hay. Once once hay gets dirty, they won't eat it. So if if it falls where they're stepping, they won't eat it once they've stepped on it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so he puts it out here, and they spread it around, and he just has to go by and just kind of sweep it back up into a pile, and, mm -hmm. and he gets the maximum use of his hay out of it out of that way just by knowing the goat behavior and, and uh, setting up the system so that it worked with goat behavior rather than against it. And so we learned a lot from from just talking to people. And I highly recommend that you learn a lot from people who have gone before you. Start on hence site. The reason, hence the reason we do these classes. Absolutely. Start on site using as many free resources as you can. So try always to think, okay, I need this. Mm -hmm. What do I have here already that can meet that need? Um, this is a different way from thinking in our materialistic culture where we're trained to run to the store every time we need something. Right. Uh, but in actuality, if we can just be patient and think things through, a lot of times we can meet the need without having to shell out any cash at all. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we might even have something on our property that, that we can use. So um, I was I was digging through some sh screws last night. I, our, our couch kind of went junk, and so okay. I had to screw it together last night. And I was digging through some screws, and I grabbed a box of screws. And what did I find in this particular box of screws? I have no idea. Some hinges. Oh, yeah. Some hinges that I had pulled off. So rather than throwing away the hinges, mm -hmm. um, I grabbed them. And I have a whole box out in my out in my shed. I have a whole box of metal parts and hinges and this kind of stuff. So I'm going to put those hinges into the box so that next time I need a hinge for something, mm -hmm. which is going to be very soon because I'm building some fencing and gating here, um, I will uh, go there instead of spend time and money to go to the hardware store. Absolutely. So, we do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, people who came on the tour of our farm last weekend, mm -hmm. the first thing we walk through is our little uh, uh, storage recycling area, recycling storage, storage area, area yep. where we, you know, we keep anything useful <laughs> because we can probably use it again. But here are some examples of how we use on-site resources. So we have uh, grass and we have weeds that grow up and we have uh, ro some rock in our yard. So this is kind of an Arizona thing. We have a rock lawn, you know, a rock border. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so um, weeds come up in those rocks. Mm -hmm. And so instead of going and getting a, you know, a, a spray to spray those weeds, which I wouldn't do anyway, or spending my hard, uh, you know, spending hard labor on taking care of those weeds, those weeds are good food for a goat. So and a goat loves to eat them. So we sent the goat out there, and she ate up those weeds right in that area. Um, also, I wanted to bump up the amount of food that we had on site for our goats, so I started growing fodder. I had some seed. Oh yeah. Because I make That's chicken feed. That's my pasture. Feed. That's my pasture. Yeah. That's what I'm doing with the pasture. Yep. So I took some of the seed that we use for chicken feed, and I just sprouted it for the goats, and you know, sprouting seeds. Uh, increases the nutritional value by, uh, I think it's three or four times, right? Uh -huh. So you get so much more nutrition out of those seeds if you sprout them. So I just grew some fodder right there in my uh, family room for our goats. Think about starting passive systems, things that don't require a lot of labor to maintain. Mm -hmm. A really good passive system is a perennial plant, a plant that will come back year oh, after yeah. year, like a fruit tree. Fruit tree. tree. <laughs> Yeah, so fruit Sorry, trees. I couldn't help myself. I get excited <laughs> when I talk fruit trees. They're a great passive food producing system. You don't have to do much to them at all, and they produce food year after year after year. Um, our composting system with our chickens, that's a passive system. 
Um, for us, it's passive. It's very mm-hmm. active for the chickens. But for us, it's passive. We don't have to do a lot for that. Um, our uh, laundry to landscape system, that automatically waters some of our trees. And it's performed by gravity. The water just runs out there uh, using the power of gravity to get to the garden. So it's it's passive. It doesn't require any extra electricity or Um, power to make that happen and I don't have to go out there with a hose just every time I wash my clothes I know that the uh, trees are going to get watered. Start strong. Quality counts. So these are some friends of ours who helped us to build a goat pen and um, we had some people who were just volunteers who knew nothing about building fencing and we had some people who had a lot of experience Mm -hmm. with goat fencing. And they helped us to build a pen really strong so that our goats wouldn't get out. And um, we did that after the fact. We had the goats first, and then we built the pen. Oh, yes. That was backwards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) really, really, really important opportunity for two things. This is, you know, the old barn raising idea. Mm -hmm. But it's also an educational opportunity. I Mm -hmm. often, in the past 20 years here at the Urban Farm, will give a class. And we'll come to, the, and I'll have people come to the urban farm. One most recently was a drip tape class. Mm-hmm. I gave a drip tape class here, and and um, that's a good example of quality count. You put in a quality product like yep. drip tape. Yep. It requires so much less management than yep. if you go cheap. Yes. Uh, if you go cheap with your irrigation, you're going to be constantly managing. Oh my God! It. Yes, absolutely. And it's a real pain, and also you have to buy the parts every time something breaks. Right. Quality count. Yeah. Yeah, and so you got the installation. People got the learning. Yep. And uh, yeah, it was win-win. And I just go. and and here's the thing. I I am a big proponent of a lifelong learning, mm-hmm. number one, but also teaching. And if you know something about something, even just you know like ten or fifteen or twenty percent more than ninety-eight percent of the people out there, you can teach about that. Mm-hmm. And you know this food revolution that we're in the midst of, and I, you know, I'm just I'm just talking the food part. There are so many other pieces about uh, in this realm of being prepared and um, you know medicine and so on and so on. If you know stuff about this, teach it. Mm-hmm. Go and teach it. It's so important that we that we all get knowledge about this kind of stuff that we know about. That's true, and we all have a different perspective on it and news and things that we can learn from each other. But uh, definitely you want to start start strong with, with good quality housing for your animals and and uh, good quality gardens and irrigation and, and all those things that are kind of the bones of your farm. And even uh, even your your animals that you get, quality counts. You know, get don't don't uh, just go cheap. Get the best animals you can, the healthiest ones. And uh, we're gonna talk more about that in later lessons. Start smooth. Make sure you have an easy workflow. Uh, I was talking this weekend on the tour that we had at our farm about how I have a a water spigot that is about uh, 20 feet away from my chicken coop. And that doesn't sound very far, but every day I was lugging the hose over there and water, you know, giving my chickens water and then Mm -hmm. rolling the hose back up so nobody would trip on it. In the summertime, I was doing that two, three times a day. So we ended up spending the the money to have somebody come in and put a spigot right next to the coop. Uh, that's what I was going to ask you. It's like, did you put a coop ne- uh, a spigot next to the we coop? We did. That's what I did. Makes things so much easier. It does. Uh, also, if you just look at the picture here, this gate. Okay, this was my DIY. I am not very handy, but I copied. That's great to me. Uh, I copied a gate, the the lower half of the gate. I copied that from a rabbit hutch that we had. And rabbit hutches tend to be low, right? Right. And so then I thought, boy, my chickens are going to get over this. I need to do something about that. So I added, I just made it taller. But what I didn't think about was that gate is a pain in the butt to go in and out of. (laughs) Of Right? Because it's so low. Every time we had to go in there, we had to duck. So we ended up um, getting a friend of ours who's really good at this kind of thing to come and build us a proper gate because that makes a mm-hmm. difference. Latches that work easily. Uh, just the simple things. Having um, nice paths so that you can move your wheelbarrow and your materials around easily. Uh, these kinds of things make a difference, and they can 
you're, they can make a difference with the energy level that you have on your farm. Because the things that you do every day, every day, should function easily. And um, so that it doesn't become a hassle every time you go out there. I know we had a, um, a gate on our, on our goat pen that was a real hassle. And uh-huh. it just sucks the energy out of me every morning when I was out there. Mm-hmm. So I ended up replacing it with a proper gate. Yep. And we ended up actually making it a two-gate system so that if a goat got out, through the first gate when I didn't want her to, mm-hmm. she had a second gate that she'd have to get through. And that way, that reduced the number of times I had to chase a goat, right? So we just, we figured out that the goats were going to rush the gate when I went out there, and um, so we just put a double gate in, and that made my life so much easier until the goats were trained not to do that. Um, so just think about smooth, easy workflows. And then just observe and adjust. There is always adjustment that happens on the farm. In the upper left-hand corner, we had placed a a rock border around the lawn, and, of course, the Bermuda grass just grew right into it because I hadn't put a proper footer. So I decided just to take that rock border out and let the Bermuda grow into it. I'm not going to fight it. Right, exactly. You know, uh, we let our turkeys, our little baby turkeys out to free range, and what I learned is that they don't really free range. They just trample everything down. Um, And here they are just trampling down my herb garden. And so we learned that turkeys are not the best free rangers, and so we adjusted how we managed our turkeys. Um, On our chicken coop, the door fell off. I realized I hadn't put proper hinges on it, so we got some better hinges (laughs) on that door. I got got hinges. Yeah, (laughs) so do we. (laughs) And uh, the picture on the right is our goat, Phoenix Rose, who got into a rabbit hutch and got stuck. So we realized we could not leave the door to the rabbit hutch open into the pen where the goats were because she would get into it. So you're always learning and adjusting when you got a farm. And that's part of the fun of it. So here's an example of of using functional analysis data to create a design, a design a simple closed system. So here is our chicken compost system where the, the chickens produce compost for the kitchen garden. The kitchen garden then produces vegetables that go into my kitchen. Mm-hmm. Then we eat those vegetables and send the scraps back to the chicken, which they compost, which goes to the kitchen garden, which produces more vegetables, mm-hmm. and it's a circle. Right? It's a very circle. simple. I love it. it. Very, very love simple. Circles. Yep. All right, and it's a closed it's a simple closed system. Okay? You don't have to bring a lot of inputs into that system to make it happen. But there's a gap in this system because uh, we've talked about redundancies and having everything supported by more than one more thing. More than one thing. So exactly. I want another form of compost for my garden. So um, taking that simple system, I added, I'm added. i adding to it a worm farm. Okay, So now the kitchen scraps can go to the worm farm and the chickens, I'll have two sources of compost that will go back to my kitchen garden. Um, And I might even have some extra worms that could go to the chickens um, for uh, them to eat some extra protein. I could also do this with black soldier fly Uh so that the larva could go to the chickens Mm -hmm. as a protein source. And they also make compost. So it could be a number of different things in here, Um, not just a worm farm. But this is how you kind of expand upon systems. You start with real simple ones, and once they are working well, then expand upon them. Add just one little more. Mm-hmm. One more element. Element. Thank you. Word I was looking for. Wasn't coming up with it. <laughs> okay, so here we are, coming to the end of the presentation, and here is your assignment. So first I want you to perform functional analysis on, let's say, five elements on your property. It could be a few more or, or one or two less. Um, But let's select a few elements that you already have and write down uh, what they need and also what they are good for. And also uh, do this for one or two elements that you don't have right now that you would like to get. And if you don't have anything yet, then I guess everything is going to be functional analysis on what you would like to get, and that's okay. Then once you have done that, I want you to select a few of the elements on your list and think about how they can be related and draw up a simple closed system to show how they can support each other on your farm. 
And then if you are on Facebook and you are part of the Urban Farm U Facebook group, mm -hmm. share that. Because that will help us all to figure out our systems. And you might have some insight that someone else needs. And you might be able to learn also from another person's um, inventive and uh, creative ways that they've created their closed systems. Um, so between now and next week, uh, I'd like you to, to do that. And it will be really helpful to you in the weeks ahead. Next week uh, is a class all about chickens. And we're going to learn all the basics of chickens, how to take care of them, whether you want chicks or whether you want to start with some laying hens. And uh, we're also going to figure out how they can fit into these kinds of systems and how you can raise your chickens with very few outside input. Uh, so oh, I that, love that. So that they can just create so much abundance on your farm without having to go out and buy a lot of things to support them. Mm -hmm. Because uh, organic feed can be expensive. It's very expensive. Yeah. I, uh, one of the things I noticed, so we, we were paying $80 a month for organic feed for our chickens. Mm -hmm. You know, we have 20 hens, so we're getting a nice amount of eggs, and we're making it back in the eggs that we sell. Sure. So it's, you know, no big deal. But it is a big deal. And one of the things that I've noticed just in the past month or month and a half is there, because uh, the, basically the chickens free range in the backyard. Um, they're eating less feed mm -hmm. because of all the greens and all the grass and weeds and all the stuff they're foraging. Right. So, yay. Yeah. That's the idea. Yep.